All right. Um, we've read James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13 many times, and I encourage you to read it again this afternoon. I'm not going to read it this morning. Um, we've read over it. The home churches have been studying it over the last couple of weeks and talked about it. Last week, we jumped over to, into Genesis chapter 45, and that's where I'd like to start this morning, is Genesis 45. As we wrap up this section uh, from James and wrap up this passage in Genesis 45 today and talking about favorites and talking about partiality today, okay? So let's look at Genesis chapter 45, starting at verse 15. If you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, if you'll, if you'll look at that passage this morning, and I'll be reading from the God's Word translation. Uh, you can follow along in, in your own uh, uh, translation or version, whatever you're using this morning, they're not too far off, okay? Starting at verse 15, he kissed all his brothers and cried with them. After this, his brothers talked with him. And Pharaoh's household heard the news that Joseph's brothers had come. Pharaoh and his officials were pleased. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, load up your animals and go back to Canaan. Take your father and your families and come to me, and I will give you the best land in Egypt. Then you can enjoy the best food in the land. Give them this order. Take wagons with you from Egypt for your children and your wives, and bring your father and come back. Don't worry about your belongings, because the best of everything in Egypt is yours. Israel's sons did as they were told. Joseph gave them wagons and supplies for their trip as Pharaoh had ordered. He gave them each of them a change of clothes, but he gave Benjamin 300 pieces of silver and five changes of clothes. He sent his father 10 male donkeys carrying Egypt's best products and 10 female donkeys carrying grain, bread, and food for his father's trip. So Joseph sent his brothers on their way. As they were leaving, he said to them, don't fight on your way back. Mm. Did he know his brothers or what? So they left Egypt and came to their father Jacob in Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. Yes, he is ruler of Egypt. Jacob was stunned and didn't believe them. Yet... When they told their father everything Joseph had said to them, and he saw wagons Joseph had sent to bring him back, his spirits were lifted. You have convinced me, Israel said. My son Joseph is still alive, and I will go and see him before I die. We left off talking about the fight that wars within us last week. And if you weren't here and didn't hear that message, I encourage you to look it up here on Facebook. It's not on the website yet. It's going to get there. Um, our tech individual is working at selling their house and wrapping up some things there, and so he's a little behind, but he's going to get there this week, hopefully, and get caught up on some things, okay? But you can find it here on Facebook. Uh, just scroll back a week and catch that message. But we left, talk, left off talking about the fight that wars within us. And we hear two voices. You know that, that old cartoon uh, that has the, the, the good angel and the little devil sitting on the shoulder, shoulders, and one is talking in one ear and one is talking in the other ear. And yeah, we talked about the struggle that goes on between our better angels and, well, you know, that other voice that talks to you, you know that voice that makes our lives complicated? None of you have complicated lives, right? If we only had our better angels talking to us, if we would only listen to the voice of the Spirit of God, if we would only listen to the voice of the Lord, if we would only listen to the Word of the Spirit, life would be so much easier. But we don't, Miss Jackie. 
And so we struggle and we wrestle and we, we even lose it from time to time. Don't we? I, and our better angels don't rise up within us. We, we forget that we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. That, that, that seems to, we get into the situations that we get into and we get into the drama that we get into and we get into the trials and we get into the tribulations that we get into and all of the sudden the promises of Scripture that promise us victory and promise us the great triumphs and promise us the strength of the Lord go pew and fly out of our head and fly out of our souls and fly out of our spirits and all of a sudden we're failing and flailing and flopping around like fish out of water. Mm. Wow. When, when, all, when all we need to do is let our better angels rise up within us and listen to the voice of God and claim the spirit that we know and claim the word of the Lord and the promises of the word that we know. I, it's not that we don't know the Word. We know the Word. We, we, we know what the Word says. Many of you who say that I can't memorize Word, know more Word than you think you know. I mean, after all, all I have to do is start saying, uh, uh, greater is... Oh my Word! You know the Word! I can. Oh my goodness, you know the word. Then why can't we live it? Oh, okay, I don't want to kill your spirit here at the beginning of the message. I'll wait till the middle, okay? We we learned last week that 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 it is natural to have this fight in us because we are in a war. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we are in a war, right? He, he tells us, he, he lists the, the armor that we're supposed to wear. I mean, if you're reading the blog that I'm writing on the website, I'm going through the armor of God that we're supposed to put on because there is a battle that's going on for our mind. There is a battle that is going on for our heart. There is a battle that's going on for our soul. And so when we get into this text, it's, it's kind of unfair because I bring you into the story at the end of the movie. It's a spoiler alert because at the time I bring you into the movie, you, you have to begin to realize there are certain things about what is going on. Because you see, bro Joseph's brothers tried to kill him. They, they tried to destroy him. They, they conspired to murder him. Him. They ultimately left him in the well and he was traumatized for God knows how long. He was naked and hungry and alone and afraid. Trauma. You think you have problems. There's a pastor who once said trouble won't last always, but trauma will stay a while. The trouble will end, but the trauma is still there. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer comes. Let's see what will become of the dreamer. What happens to your dream when trouble comes? What happens to your dream when delays come? Because you all have dreams, right? You all have visions, right? But what happens when delays come? Oh, I can see buying that house. I can buy that house. I know it's there. It's mine. I see it. The Lord has given it to me. Oh, but I got denied by the bank. The brand new car is mine. I can see it. Oh, that husband. <laughs> He's mine. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's the one. I can see it. Oh, he's so good. Oh, he's good looking. Yeah. And there he goes. 
What, what happens? What happens to your dream when delays come? What happens to your dreams when betrayers come? What happens to your dreams when the money doesn't come? When the support isn't there? When people sabotage you? You see, the enemy wants to kill your dream. And none of it would have happened if it wasn't for these brothers who were his brothers and his killers at the same time. Every person in this room and watching online has situations in their family that's hard to explain. Oh, see, I, I told you I'd kill that spirit, didn't I? We all have situations in our families that's hard to explain. You know, that, that situation where I love you, but you get on my nerves. But don't look at your brother. <laughs> but don't worry, your brother's looking at you too. It's good to have your brother here this morning and his wife. Come on over for dinner, but I can't forget what you said about me. And, but, but Joseph has the ability to deal with this huge situation with a grace that is difficult to explain. And, it's, and it is here that we come to understand that with the bombarding of emotions coming out of him from all levels, his love is stronger than his memory. Yeah. You see, you see, I, I have to look at this text. I, I, when, when I look at this text, I realize that they are both in a famine. Both sides are in a famine. That his brothers are in a famine for food, but Joseph is in a famine for family. They were st the, the brothers were starving for stuff, but he was starving for them. And suddenly when I realized what made him cry, I realized that I've never preached him well because I was distracted by what he went through. But, it, but, but, but what he went through in the pit and in Potiphar's house and in the prison didn't compare with why he went through it. Because it is not the what that kills us. It, it's not the what. I, I'm strong enough to make it through the what. It's the why. I realize that it, that it is not his body plummeting down through the hole to the bottom of the well that was the most painful. It was not the lacerations on his skin or the beatings on his back or, or being sold for 20 pieces of silver. It was not that Potiphar's wife lied on him that gave him the most grief. It was that his dream was tied to his family. And how can the dream come to pass when the people I love I can't reap love back after I've sowed love in. I, I, when, when, when the people I love, I can't reap that back. I give love to you. I can't get love back from you. I want to talk to some people who are, who are partially successful. You have gone, you, you have it going on in this part of your life, but in this part of your life, all hell is breaking loose. And you have it going on over here. And, and, and you're the envy of everybody. But over here, you go home and you deal with something completely different. On the one hand, it's the best of times. And on the other hand, it's the worst of times. On the one hand, you're at the top of your game. And on the other, there is nagging, haunting, aching feeling that will not leave your heart. It will not go away. 
What do you do when your love won't go away and your common sense says, leave them alone? Is there anybody in here that's got stubborn love? Tenacious love? Relentless love? Is there anybody in here that has told yourself, I'm not going to do nothing. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to help. I'm not going to open my mouth. And all the while you're saying that, you're fixing dinner and saying, come on in and get something to eat. Is there anybody in here that's been mad at yourself for being too nice? Somebody talk to me this morning. Because I can't be the only one in here that's gotten mad at myself and told myself, you're just stupid. You're stupid. You let people run all over you. Never realizing that what I hate about myself is what God loved about me. Never realizing that the whole basis of God's favor on my life is because I have stubborn love. You see, it hurts to have stubborn love. It hurts to keep on caring, even when you're treated fairly. But there's something down inside of you that cannot render evil for evil. It hurts to say, I'm sorry, when you know you weren't wrong. It hurts to hold your peace when you know you're right about something. Do you understand what I'm talking to about this morning? I know that this isn't for everybody. I know that not everyone is going to get this message, but I know that there's somebody watching me right now who knows what it's like to argue with yourself all night long and say what you're not going to do and get up in the morning and do it anyway because you have stubborn love. And now, now I see why God chose him. God chose him because God chose him because God could trust him. God couldn't trust the other brothers to have the radical kind of love that could take that that could look beyond what was done to them. God needed a lover. Somebody that would love anyhow. So that he could work out his purpose and his will. You see, he could not work out his purpose through somebody who was vindictive and spiteful and hateful and could not find their better angels. But God said, this is the moment that will require your better angels. In order to get what God has for you right now, in order for us to function as the church, not the little C church, but as the church, as what James is talking about in James chapter 2, as believers this morning, because remember, he's talking to believers this morning, and if you're not a believer this morning, you need to get saved this morning. But James is talking to believers this morning, and in order for us to function as the church this morning, it will require that we summon our better angels and that we stop calling it weak to be stubborn love. There's a, there's a, there's a couple of things that I'd like for us to get out of this passage. We all real quiet this morning. One of, one of the things that, that I want us to deal with is how do you handle advantage? Because how you handle advantage determines whether God will trust you with power. First, first let, let me tell you that each of you ha- who have a relationship with the Lord are highly favored. You are advantaged. You, you are advantaged over all the rest of humanity. You have been chosen your royal priesthood and you have been given power through the Holy Spirit. 
But the, the, the advantage that Joseph handled, you see, God blessed him with the power in Egypt. After all, he was second in command. But, but you know that some people can't handle power because they're so vengeful that if they ever got the upper hand, they're going to go for revenge rather than for reconciliation. And if you've been praying for power and you've been praying for promotion, but God can't trust you with promotion, maybe it's because your heart is not big enough to have the power that you're asking for and to have the kind of favor that God wants to give you. It will go to somebody whose heart is bigger than their head. Listen, that, that will happen in business. That will happen in family. And that will happen in the church as well. If we show favorites, if we show partiality, if we are looking for power to lift us up, to lift up people who are important and put others down, then God will lift His blessing and give it to somebody else. Well, this is tough, I know. But I'm seeing it over and over and over again. And I believe that God is leading us through this so that we don't fall into the same trap ourselves. How do you handle advantage? The, the second thing that I want us to see is that love never fails. It, it may take a long time. It, 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 may, it may look like it's been knocked out. It, it may get bloodied. It may get bruised. It may even require stitches. But when the fight is over, love will always prevail. Uh, can, can, can your love survive a fall? Joseph had taken a fall in the well, but his love survived the fall. You, you can't raise children if your love can't take a fall. You can't have a relationship if your love can't take a fall. You can't run a business if your love can't withstand a fall. You can't be the church if your love can't withstand a fall. Oh, no amens on any of those. Okay. Then maybe your love hasn't withstood the fall. I I'm going to tell you something this morning. In, in every one of those situations, with maybe the exception of business, because I don't own a business... Well, I did own a business, but I, I don't own a business and was never a big in business, but in every one of those situations, my love has taken a fall. From raising my family, my kids, my love has taken a fall. When they, when they disappoint me, when they dis my love took a fall. When they made choices that, that, that hurt, my love took a fall. How, how do I deal with that? How do we deal with that? Huh? We love in spite of any way, right? That's the way we should. In the church, oh, that's hard. Because in the church, you're going to have people, especially if you're in leadership, you're going to have people who will stab you in the back, sabotage what you're trying to do. You're trying to help people, trying to lead them, trying to meet needs, trying to lead them along. But you have to remember that you can bring them to water, but they may not drink. And it gets hard. Oh, it is hard. It is difficult. And you're going to have people that will go behind you and have Sunday school in the hallway. You know what I mean? And it ain't spiritual. And, and all of a sudden, instead of you being a leader, you're on the blacklist. 
And, and there's all of this talk and all of this going on in the church about the leader. And, and instead of us building up, we're tearing down. How are you going to love that person that is talking about you in the hallway at the church? And they're your brother and sister in the Lord. Oh, we love in sp- Love never fails. You can't, you can't, we can't be the church if our love can't withstand a fall. I, I'm here to tell you today that in 30 some years of ministry and being in every church I've been in, There have been times where my love has taken a fall in the church. it, 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 It happens. But love never fails. Have you ever dreamed? Have you ever had a dream where you were falling? You ever had a dream that way? Do you, do you remember that powerless feeling of falling? And how frightening it is when you wake up right before you smack the ground? I mean, you're there because, because you're falling and it feels like things are out of control and things are going to be, and there are going to be some moments in your life that feels like everything is out of control. Joseph has gone through a long period of bad getting worse and the only thing consistent is that he is still in love with his family now I will admit I know that it is true there are some people that you have to love at a distance there there are some people that are so mm, unsafe to love, that you have to love them at a distance because, because uh, who, who they are at this stage in their life, it, it, who they are at this stage is, is not who they're going to become at that stage. But for right now, I have to love you at 50 feet, not six feet that the CDC says, not three feet. I know what they say, but if I'm going to love you, it needs to be 50. You're crazy, so give me 50 feet. You're going through some changes. Give me 50 feet. Is there anybody in here that... you you got to give them some distance. All right, the third thing I want to ask is, do you have the grace to accommodate people changing? Or are you still angry over something that's 20 years old? You have the kind of grace to accommodate, to accommodate that says, I may look like the same person, but I'm not the same person at this stage in my life that I was at that stage in my life. So much time had passed that they didn't even recognize Joseph. Some of you have been holding a grudge so long that you can't even remember the details. You just remember the anger. And you're still mad. God wants your better angels to arise so that you can walk in the favor that He has for you. You can walk in the victory that He has for you. But it's going to require that your better angels arise and you stop trying to be your own defense. Because anger often keeps love from being exposed. Get rid of the anger and forgive. Number four, you know, in order for God to deal with you, number four, you have to have emotional honesty, even if it makes you feel vulnerable to be emotionally honest. Joseph is emotionally honest. He cannot help the fact that he loves his family. He cannot control their behavior. He can only control his. And you see it here in verse 15. He cries when he, when he sees his brothers. There's tears. There is emotional tears. And, and so 
He's emotionally vulnerable. And because of that, number five, he can bless them because your enemies, he, he can bless them and, and bless, and you bless your enemies even though they cursed him. There was a pastor who attended another pastor's church and he was a young pastor and the young pastor decided he was leaving the church. And so the senior pastor called a mentor of his for advice and he says, you know, I've given this young pastor the stage, I've given him a platform, I've helped him along, I've taught him, I've invested in him, and now this young pastor is taking members of mine and going out and starting a church. He's stabbing me in the back and, and, and I don't know what I should do. What I want to do, I know what I want to do, but I don't know what I should do. The mentor looked at this senior pastor across the table and the cups of coffee that were sitting there and the mentor said, take a love offering for him. What? Why should I give him a love offering? And the mentor said, because you are too big to have unnecessary enemies. He's going to have enough to fight without you. You don't have to fight him. Life is going to fight him. Life is going to change him. Don't add your name to the list. Don't you take the high road. This family, Joseph's family, have been ripped apart. And they are part of God's divine purpose. This family is important because God is going to use this family to start the nation of Israel. And they have been ripped apart for years. And the thing about a rip, that, that whenever something is torn, is that both sides get damaged. Whenever something is ripped, both sides are damaged. You go home bleeding and you think you're the only one bleeding. You go home and cry and you think you're the only one crying. But if it's ripped, both sides are going to cry. Both sides are going to suffer. They, they, they may not show you, but there's no clean way to have a rip. You don't have a straight side and a ripped side when something rips. It rips and tears on both sides. Joseph's coat was ripped from him and his family was ripped from him and both sides were filled with pain. God was getting ready to do something so amazing that he was looking for somebody who was big enough to do it through. And Joseph understood something that God had brought him into favor to be a channel to bless them. That the only reason God put him into power is so that his power would be used for the posterity and the legacy of God. And if God can get it through you, He can get it into you. He can get it to you. If God can trust you that your flesh won't get in the way. Oh, I want to talk to you this morning who's been talking to God about what He wants to do in your life. Because if God can trust you, the higher He takes you, you'll still reach low and pull somebody else up. If God can trust you that when He opens a door, you'll reach back and open a door for somebody else. If God can trust you this morning, that right where you are, right in your Egypt, believer, because after all, we're all in this world. We're not of this world. But as believers, we're not of this world. Oh, we're walking through this world. And we're walking through Egypt. But God is working in your life. And as you allow Him to move in your life, as you open up your life to Him, and as you allow Him to shift you, 
As you allow Him to change you, He'll raise you up in your Egypt. God will take you through your trial. He'll take you through your test. He'll take you through that Egypt so that you'll be able to handle what He's about to do next. There's a reason we're going through this study right now. It's in this season of our lives because God is about to raise us from the prison to the palace, getting a, getting ready to for a switch, getting ready for a turn, getting ready for a change, getting ready for a move. If you'll open up to Him, if you'll surrender to Him, if you'll allow Him, He'll step into your prison and take you from that stinky, smelly, moldy cell that you're in and release you from those chains and set you free this morning and he'll take you from the jail cell to the palace room but you'll have to open up and let him work right now I'm telling you this morning God wouldn't be taking us through this pandemic God wouldn't be bringing wouldn't be bringing through God wouldn't be bringing the, through these challenges, believers, if something wasn't about to happen. God wouldn't be teaching us on Wednesday nights about holiness and about sanctification. God wouldn't be teaching us on Sunday about how to love others and about how to love Him and about how to have maturity and power if we were going to stay weak and busted and disgusted because there's something that God wants to switch in our lives that we have to be ready to receive. And I'm telling you this morning that we need to give Him some praise in advance for the blessing that is on the way for those believers today. And, and, and this is something, this is something, this is something that we're going through now that 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 is that that is that has been on the way since before this pandemic it's just waking us up to what we need to do now we need to see what we need to see is that all of a sudden the wealth of Egypt was transferred to the house of Jacob Ooh. oh I, i'm going to I'm not going to get into the rest of the message there because I want to stop right there. The wealth of Egypt was transferred to the house of Jacob. And, 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 and we see that fulfilled when they walked out of Egypt over 400 years later. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Passover came. Right? They went through the plagues, right? They were in slavery for over 400 years. This family of 80 grew to over 1.2 million people, right? And they, they went through the plagues. They had a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, and so they started to enslave them. You read the first book of, the first chapter of Exodus. You, you read it, and there was a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, and so he enslaved them because he came afraid of the church. And the church grows in persecution. Oh, 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 y'all, y'all should have hollered at that one. The church grows in persecution. The church grows in trials. The church grows in tribulation. The church grows in a pandemic. The church grows through, through, through hardships. The church grows in inflation. The church grows with gas prices over three bucks a gallon. Oh, oh you didn't want to hear that one, huh? Okay. Okay, but, but keep in mind, keep in mind now, keep in mind now, they received the best land in Egypt. So they settled down in Goshen. That was the best land. This, this family of 80 
settled down in Goshen. All the wealth, the best of Egypt was transferred to the house of Jacob. And when they left Egypt, the Egyptians paid them to leave. Woo! Church, church, you may be in Egypt today, but there is a blessing that when you allow God to work in your life, the best of Egypt is transferred to the house of Jacob. And when you leave Egypt, you leave with the blessings that the enemy has. And the enemy, when you accept Christ as your Savior, when you allow the power of God to work in your life, when you go through that second work of grace that Pastor Watts is talking about on Wednesday night and you surrender to Him completely and start allowing the Spirit to work in your life and change you from head to toe and work in your life and He becomes Lord of your life and you start to become what God wants you to become and mature and holy because he is holy. Listen, the enemy starts to pay you to get out of his house because you're causing too much trouble in his house. They paid the Israelites to leave the house because they were causing too much trouble in the house. <sighs> Did you ever think of it that way? And it started back when the Pharaoh said, are we going to give you the best? And the wealth of Egypt was transferred to the house of Jacob. Oh. Ain't, ain't that exciting? And we walk out with the blessings. There was a lady, elderly lady, who came out on the porch. She was a believer. Neighbor was an atheist. She came out on the porch every day. And she shouted as loud as her lungs would let her, God, I thank You for today. I thank You for another day to praise Your name for the air that's in my lungs, for the house that I have, for all the blessings that you've given me. And the atheist, her atheist neighbor would say, how can you praise God? You're crippled. You're old. You're broke. How can you praise God? He had a ton of money. Very wealthy healthy. How can you praise God? And she said, God's been so good to me all through my life. I just have to praise the Lord. And he said, you're just a crazy old lady. And she said, well, praise God. I thank the Lord anyhow. And she would turn around. This happened every day. And she'd turn around and walk into her house singing the praises of God. And, and she'd sing all day long with her windows open. At the top of her lungs, she would sing the songs of glory. And he listened every day. So one day, he bought groceries for her and put them on the porch. And hid in the bushes. And she came out, saw those groceries, and she went, Praise the Lord! My cupboards are full! Thank you, God, for this provision! And just then, the atheist jumped out of the bush and he says, I bought those groceries! God didn't provide them! And she said, And thank you that the enemy bought them for me! <laughs> Oh, don't you see? God can even use the enemy to bless you.
the best of Egypt was transferred to the house of Jacob. Do you have, and I know as a believer you've experienced a love that never fails because God has a love that never fails, but do you have a love that never fails? You see, in order to overcome partiality, we have to show a love that never fails. So, I don't know where you are in your walk this morning. Have you forgiven things of the past? Do you need to love more? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Joseph had a love that looked beyond the hurt and the offense and forgave. I would bet that if you talk to Joseph the moment he was put on the cart after being sold, I would bet that he probably already forgave his brothers at that point. Think about it. Are you willing to do that? Have you done that? You see, this isn't just for non-believers, although non-believers need to get saved. This is for believers that hold on. If we want true victory in our lives, we've got to let go. So I encourage you this morning to let go. And let God. And see what He does in your life. I'll bet it'll change it. And I'll bet your life will be better for it. Let's pray together.